morning session the first talk would be on pancreas transplantation current practice may i invite the speaker dr stefan g tulius i also invite the chairpersons for this talk dr jamal rizvi dr sj acharya and dr sanjay kolte over to the chairpersons good morning i'd like to welcome uh, dr stefan tulius to talk uh, to us about the current trends in pancreas transplant and it's a talk we will be looking forward to pancreas transplant is still in a in a fledgling state in india partly because uh, disease donor programs in the past have been rather small but with growing programs and the return of uh, of uh, surgeons trained in pancreas transplant there are several centers across the country which are beginning to do pancreas transplant and it would really um, you know we are looking forward eagerly to hear uh, dr stephen tulius tell us about his experiences thank you very much uh, mr sherwood for uh, inviting me to give this lecture i think it is uh, recorded so um, it can yes sir dr stephen just a moment Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Prakash, uh, Dr. Koti, Dr. Abraham, Dr. Nair, um, officers and executive members of the Indian Society of Organ Transplantation, thank you so much for allowing me to talk to you about pancreas transplantation in the current practice. This is a very relevant and uh, timely discussion and uh, talk to give, and I hope that I will be able to show you some aspects uh, that are particularly relevant in pancreas uh, transplantation, the development of pancreas transplantation, the progress that we have seen, and ending with a most uh, recent consensus uh, paper um, uh, that uh, shows on how important pancreas transplantation remains uh, to be. Briefly about the history of pancreas transplantation, the first pancreas uh, transplanted uh, successfully in 1966 at the University of Minnesota by Kelly and Lillehei. And here you see that the gland is being connected to um, uh, the artery and the vein much in the way as we continue to do this right now. The exocrine function that has always been uh, in the Achilles heel of the surgical Achilles heel of uh, the procedure um, uh, is here not optimally um, uh, resolved. The pancreatic duct here is ligated and we know that this will end in a significant uh, pancreatitis. There are several ways to, de to deal with the exocrine function of the pancreas and I'm going to show you um, uh, that in one second. Three different types of pancreas uh, transplants are uh, of relevance and importance. Uh, most, uh, the most um, uh, frequent approach to pancreas transplantation is the simultaneous pancreas kidney transplantation, a pancreas after kidney transplantation, mostly for patients who have a living donor for the kidney and then are being transplanted with a pancreas after the kidney transplant, and for patients with a challenging to control uh, diabetes, a pancreas transplant alone in the absence of a kidney transplant. I mentioned the exocrine um, uh, uh, drainage of the pancreas uh, earlier, two ways to be dealing with this, either through the bladder drainage or, which I'm going to show you in one second, uh, through the drainage of um, uh, the, um, uh, through an enteric uh, drainage. What you see here is the bladder drainage um, connection of the duodenum to the bladder that has the advantage of measuring pancreatic enzymes uh, in the bladder, thus having an assessment on the craft function, potential rejection. However, there are increased urological and metabolic complications that go along with the bladder drainage. The alternative, and that is the most frequent approach that we see today is the anastomosis of the duodenal segment to the recipient's intestine. That is the more physiological approach. However, if there is anything um, that results into a compli complication of the enteric anastomosis, that may then result into an intraabdominal abscess or into a pancreatitis. The enteric uh, drainage, again, is 
in general the preferred way of dealing with the enteric anastom with uh, the exocrine uh, excretion of the pancreas. The venous drainage is another aspect that we can deal with in two different ways. There can be a systemic drainage versus a portal venous drainage. The advantages and disadvantages in theory of the portal venous, portal, portal venous drainage include uh, a normal insulin level, a possible immunological benefit. The disadvantages described by some with a higher thrombosis rate it is not possible in that context to do a bladder drainage. And it is uh, um, uh, somewhat more challenging to proceed with a pancreas uh, uh, biopsy. Overall, there is no strong evidence that the portal versus the systemic venous drainage would provide benefit of one procedure over the other here, a study shown by Bob Strader uh, from uh, Wake Forest that both approaches, either the portal or the systemic drainage, did not show significant outcomes differences in regard to morbidity here for acute rejection infection and the necessity of revisions. Pancreas transplantation, at least in this country, has um, been predominantly done by larger centers. There are many centers that provide the procedures and there are only a few centers that have done a large amount of pancreas transplants. Here, data of more than 1,000 kidney transplants by the University of Minnesota. And in this study, the authors did divide their outcomes by era, starting with the first uh, era, the historic uh, um, uh, transplant cohort, then with the improvements in regard to surgical techniques, bladder and then enteric amastomosis, and also the immunosuppression, the um, both referring to maintenance as well as to the induction treatment. And the era three and four is the more recent era. And you see that there has been a constant improvement of patient pancreas graft survival, kidney graft survival, and pancreas, uh, a decline of pancreas rejection for simultaneous uh, kidney and pancreas transplants. And the same is seen here in pancreas after kidney transplants. Again, a significant improvement on all parameters in regard to outcomes for the techniques of pancreas transplantation that are available. Very much the same here shown by the group uh, in Wisconsin, Hans Sollinger, who presented of, of more than a thousand pancreas transplants at this center in 2009. And the important message of this slide here is that the simultaneous kidney pancreas transplant shows overall for patients with type one diabetes, an improved survival compared to live kidney donors, deceased kidney donors, or staying on dialysis. So a clear evidence that this is a simultaneous kidney pancreas transplant serves for patients with diabetes type one best in regard to their potential of improving um, patient and craft survival. Now, there is a very important aspect uh, that uh, is relevant uh, to discuss, and that is the overall volume of uh, pancreas transplants. And what you see here is the amount of pancreas transplants being done in the US, those are the dark bars, and in the um, area outside of the US. Actually, this is this should be the opposite way around. The light bars are those who are outside of the US and the, the dark bars are those who are, who are um, outside uh, uh, of the US and the, the light bars are the ones that are in the US. 
So what you see here, a decline, even so that we have just seen the improvements of craft in patient survival, a decline of the volume of pancreas transplants in the US. And numbers outside the US have been steady. I want to point out that up till now, there have been approximately 50,000 kidney transplants being done worldwide, most of them in the US, but a significant amount outside the US and that amount has been increasing. Also, most recent numbers shows that also internationally, we see an overall decline in pancreas transplant activity. And the same is then true for patients being listed for pancreas transplantation. And that again is true for pancreas, for the different forms of pancreas transplants that I have shown you before. So less patients being listed and less pancreas transplants being performed. Quickly, I want to run through the outcomes that and the uh, potential complication rates, technical failure, um, is the most frequent reason for pancreas transplants not to work. Rejection rates are in the range uh, as we see them with uh, kidney transplant, uh, transplants and there are low rates for primary and non-functional. If the surgical procedure works well, then the long-term outcome after kidney transplantation, uh, after a pancreas transplantation is excellent. Now, there has also been an effort most recently to, to transplant pancreas with, uh, to do pancreas transplants for patients with a diabetes type 2. There are specific criteria um, for that. And the outcomes for qualifying patients with pancreas, uh, receiving pancreas transplants for diabetes type 2 are excellent as well. A critical portion has always been, will the pancreas transplant be able to reverse or to halt the secondary complications? There are some indications that the diabetic nephropathy can be slowed down in their progress, or here, in this case, there, has, there is also um, an indication that the diabetic nephropathy is going to improve. And the neuropathy has been shown here. Here, this is a normal um, uh, segment uh, uh, of a calf where we see nerves uh, um, shown in green and yellow, the basement membrane in red and the epidermis and vessels in blue. And you see how sparse those structures become under diabetic conditions, and then post-transplant, an improvement of the nervous innervation and a reduction of the neuropathy. So we have those case reports. However, overall, this remains not entirely clear if the secondary complications can be improved. A quick um, uh, mentioning on live donor pancreas transplants, they have been performed by specialized centers. Um, uh, approximately 160 cases uh, have been performed, outcomes have been well. However, there have been challenges um, in regard to the metabolic demand that, that has been seen in some living donors. And I think it is fair to say that this is an exception in regard to be dealing with patients uh, that require, require insulin replacement treatment. So the critical question is, should we perform pancreas transplants today? And what we see is, and one of the reasons that we perform less pancreas transplants today is that we have ways of controlling the insulin replacement through other means in a better way here. Um, report of a bionic pancreas uh, uh, um, shown and a, a direct uh, feedback loop is allowing that the insulin replacement will be done in a more physiological way. Now, there have been several studies that, con that compared 
the outcomes of pancreas transplant alone, pancreas after kidney, and simultaneous uh, uh, kidney pancreas in, um, in regard to their advantage. And you see here that there is a clear advantage still of a, a simultaneous uh, 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 pancreas kidney transplant, a pancreas transplant after um, uh, a kidney transplant, uh, sorry, a pancreas transplant alone has some benefits and the pancreas transplant after a kidney transplant has some benefits. However, that is not as clear. I want to close by giving you some data on the first world con consensus conference on pancreas transplantation that has just very recently been published. That has been a very thorough process that evaluated uh, um, uh, numerous uh, publications and tried to distill them in a way that they would allow us to build a consensus on what we should be doing with uh, pancreas transplants today. They show that simultaneous kidney pancreas improves both quality and long-term craft survival, that a pancreas after kidney transplant increases the risk of early post-surgical mortality, but improves life expectancy, that the pancreas transplant alone does not increase long-term risk of death, and that there needs to be a careful selection for those patients with um, uh, sufficient kidney function. In regard to the surgical techniques, here it has been also shown that the enteric anastomosis and the enteric drainage is preferable. As I said before, no study shows a clear benefit of portal versus the um, systemic venous uh, drainage, and the immunosuppression includes in the induction with the bleeding antibodies. The CNI avoidance uh, shows inferior immunological outcomes, and the triple immunosuppression as a maintenance immunosuppression seems to be preferable. So in summary, in conclusion, whole organ pancreas transplant provide excellent long-term craft outcomes. Transplant volumes have declined. Also, outcomes have improved. There are several reasons for that. And the educational and promotional efforts are needed to emphasize on the advantages of pancreas transplantation. Thank you very much again for your kind invitation. Thank you, Dr. Julius. That was an excellent overview of pancreas transplant. And um, as, you know, as, as, as we've realized here, pancreas transplant is challenging and um, it but I think, you know, with, with India, which has a, a, a large population and large diabetic population, really is the need of the R. And with an increasing um, disease donor program, we, we, we should be able to increase our numbers, which today, which are, you know, maybe less than 50 a year now. So I, I had a question for you. Um, could you tell us a little bit about criteria for doing pancreas transplant in type 2 diabetics? I know that it's not, you know, uh, it's not, a, uh, it's not necessary, it's not completely accepted as standard of care, but there's a subset of type 2s perhaps who behave like type 1s. So which, which, which kind of type 2s would you accept for a pancreas transplant? So <clears throat> that is driven by the patient's BMI and the patient's uh, C-peptide uh, production. So um, uh, um, uh, the C-peptide uh, uh, in those patients is still expected to be significantly decreased or low in order to predict that a pancreas transplant in diabetes type 2 patients is going to be um, uh, an advantage for those patients. They have been done um, in, a, in a subset of selected patients. And as I said before, um, in those patients, uh, 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 pancreas transplants uh, for diabetes type 2 have shown excellent results. Right, thank you. And uh, briefly, could you tell us, um, do, do you practice steroid sparing uh, in, in your program? Um, we do not, and, uh, but uh, some people do. And um, uh, I think, you know, we uh, reduce our um, uh, um, uh, steroids to a, a very small amount uh, uh, of prednisolone, um, but uh, usually um, we do not uh, spare uh, prednisolone. 
Right, thank you. Um, if there are any other questions from the other chairpersons or the audience, I'd, I'd welcome that. So I think we have a few minutes. So Dr. Tulis, one last question, if I may. Um, talking about the selection of donors for a pancreas transplant, I mean, I, I, I have the impression that in America, you're fairly strict in your criteria of, of choosing non-obese, young, um, uh, head injured uh, donors. Whereas in, in, in Europe, my understanding is that they're going more and more towards it. They're pushing the boundaries with regard to age, with regard to BMI, and um, even including non-heart beating. So, you know, I'd be interested in your perspectives on this. Yeah, that's a very good question. And it's very correct, uh, the statement. Uh, DCD donors have been used in this country as well. Um, um, uh, and I would agree with you that uh, the selection, donor selection in the US is more restrictive uh, um, uh, than in Europe. Um, I think this has to do with the overall very stringent um, supervision of outcomes in, in this country and the reduction of patients being listed that allows them to be more selective. But I would agree with you that the, I mean, as, as it is shown in uh, some centers in Europe, uh, that you can be more liberal with your donor selection and uh, still produce a uh, grant. Right, because when you start a program, that's the dilemma that you face. You know, you want to be selective and take only the best donors, but if you're going to be too selective, you're not going to get your numbers up. So I think it's a bit of a balancing exactly. game you have to play until you, you get the confidence. Exactly. And I think, um, you, you know, that's uh, that's the problem. If you start a program, I would, you know, the recommendation would be probably to be initially more selective. I think, you know, as I said, the, the biggest dilemma in for pancreas transplantation right now is that uh, it's undervalued. Um, and uh, I think that is a dilemma. Um, and, and I think it's overall an educational effort that needs to take place that the providers outside of surgery are being educated, uh, that endocrinologists are educated, nephrologists are educated uh, to show them that uh, pancreas uh, transplantation indeed is a very valid and valuable. Professor Tulias, we use the immunosuppressants like cyclosporine and tacrolimus for kidney transplant and these are diabetogenic by themselves. So in case of pancreas transplant, are you using cyclosporine and tacrolimus? Uh, will it not uh, cause the diabetes again? Uh, correct. And uh, the same would be true for steroids. Yes. I mean, uh, 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 we, we, we do that. And um, um, I think um, those are the side effects that we are dealing with with immunosuppressants. I mean, they are nephrotoxic as well, and uh, we use them in kidney transplantation. And uh, uh, our immunosuppression overall is imperfect, as it is for any for organ, kidneys and pancreas. Um, what was the five-year survival of the 16 patients that you have quoted? At the end of one year, uh, 15 patients, they survived, but at the end of five years, what was the survival? Um, I'm not sure what uh, slide you are referring to, but the survival um, uh, after um, uh, five years um, uh, is usually at about uh, 70%. Right. So there are no further questions. I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tulias, for sharing your experiences with us. And we hope thank to you very much. And maybe, you know, maybe tell you about you know, how, how our programs are doing. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thanks again for the invitation. Thank Bye. Thank you, Dr. Stefan. I also take this opportunity to thank the chairpersons for chairing the session.